Tonight's program is of particular interest for all of us on the staff at the Library and Museum, for it offers a rare opportunity to feature a speaker who not only has done research in our collections, but who has also brought to life a major critical challenge faced by the Ford administration. The spring of 1975 was a traumatic time for our nation as Americans watched the end of our involvement in the war in Southeast Asia unfold on our television screens. Few will ever forget the images of helicopters and cargo planes airlifting Americans and Vietnamese refugees out of Saigon. There were scenes of panic and chaos as desperate Vietnamese tried to storm the U.S. Embassy and U.S. Marines sought to hold back the crowds. Here at the Ford Library, we have the cables that went back and forth from Washington to Saigon as President Ford and Henry Kissinger and other advisors monitored the situation and pushed forward with the evacuation. And as some of you know, and our speaker will discuss tonight, we also have the iconic staircase from the top of the U.S. Embassy, which was a key part in that final evacuation. The tension of the time in the cables is absolutely palpable, and you are cordially invited to visit and research those yourself at any time. This was a very painful time for President Ford, who wrote that those were his worst days in the White House. He felt that the United States could not abandon those South Vietnamese who helped Americans during the long years of conflict, nor could he abandon the Americans still in Vietnam. And he felt strongly about the children who were of mixed Vietnamese and American blood, that they could not be left behind. They were the innocents who would probably suffer the most. Ford lobbied Congress for additional funds to support the fledgling South Vietnamese Army, but Congress flatly denied the requests. There would be no more funds for a very unpopular war. Ford took it upon himself to muster as much military support to evacuate everyone that could be helped in the days and hours before Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese. Brent Scowcroft, then the President's National Security Advisor, later recalled that Ford's actions were the most courageous he had ever witnessed in a president. Later, Ford called on many favors to place the Vietnamese refugees all over the country, and it is no coincidence that Ford's hometown of Grand Rapids is home to a large Vietnamese community. Our speaker tonight has taken on this period of our nation's history and brings it to life in a most riveting manner. Tom Clavin is the author or co-author of 11 books with the 12th and 13th books coming out in the next two years. He was last here in 2007 to talk about his New York Times bestseller, Halsey's Typhoon, and we are still talking about that book. We are very pleased to have him with us tonight to talk about his newest book, Last Men Out. Tom's passion for writing and research is apparent in the amazing scope and profusion of his publications. Hundreds of articles have appeared in regional and national magazines ranging from Cosmopolitan, Family Circle, Gulf Journal, Good Housekeeping, Good Housekeeping to Parade and the Reader's Digest. He's been an editor-in-chief of a weekly newspaper chain and a contributing reporter and op-ed writer for the New York Times. He's currently associate editor of two national publications that are published monthly and writes a bi-weekly internet golf column and a weekly op-ed column. He's been honored with numerous national and regional awards. Tonight, he brings us highlights of his newest book, which focuses on the final 24 hours of the Vietnam War, telling the remarkable stories of the 11 young Marines who were the last men to leave the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. The book is based on a wealth of declassified documents and in-depth first-hand accounts. Tom and his co-author, Bob Drury, gained access to the actual transmissions between helicopter pilots, their officers, officials in Saigon, and the White House, as recorded by the National Security Agency. They also had the full cooperation of the eight surviving men of those last 11 Marines, enabling the riveting story to be told by those who lived it. As with Halsey's Typhoon, I can personally attest that Live Men Out is a true story that reads like a thriller. It immediately engages the reader and never lets go. Please join me in welcoming journalist and author Tom Clavin. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have a couple of reasons for being grateful for that introduction. One, because it was, uh, it was such a gracious uh, introduction. I appreciate that, having, always having nice things said about you. 
And the other reason is to, to contrast it with, uh, I won't name the place, but I was in Chicago a couple of nights ago to give a talk, and the person who introduced me at that venue uh, got up to begin the introduction, and the first thing he said to the audience is he pointed out where the exits were. <laughs> so I was less than reassured. Uh, this, this introduction gives me a lot more confidence. Uh, but just in case, there's an exit right there, <laughs> one right there. So please take advantage of them if, if, the, if the impulse strikes. Um, also, before I, I get into the main part of the talk, I, I, I do want to emphasize that uh, uh, this book, uh, Last Men Out, I, I really don't think would exist if it were not for the uh, Ford Museum in Grand Rapids. And then after that, uh, this library right here. Uh, in the case of the Ford Museum, I, I was there in January of 2007 to give a talk about uh, the book Halsey's Typhoon. And before my talk, uh, I was given a tour of the museum. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you should. Many of you probably have, but it's, it's a wonderful place. And uh, I was told that uh, there are, you know, seeing the different artifacts and documents and, and things that are on display there or available at the museum, that there really is a lot that the public does not know about what happened in the last 24 hours in the fall of Saigon. There's so much that's not, never been told that we don't know about, and uh, you might want to think about doing a book on it. And I sort of filed that away at the time, and my co-author, Bob Drury, was, and I were already committed to doing another book, so it was, but when we were finished with that, we revisited this idea, and uh, our, our publisher was very, very interested in, in, in doing it. And then I was back here at the library in October 2009, uh, and as usual, the staff was very friendly and helpful uh, to find information that uh, is available to anybody who wants it here at the library, but is unknown to, to much of the American public. And one of the things that came out of it uh, to us, and we hope by extension to the people who read the book, is uh, what a courageous decision it was on the part of President Ford to order the evacuation of Saigon. And I won't, this isn't an academic exercise, I'm not gonna go into great detail about it, but the president, it was not Gerald Ford's war, Vietnam. You, know, you could say that maybe it began with, uh, with advisors that were sent in during Eisenhower and the Kennedy administrations, and of course, uh, during President Johnson's administration, we had the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and the, the escalation of the war to, to unprecedented proportions. Uh, and then uh, Richard Nixon uh, was president when the war was still going on, and he engineered the Paris Peace Accords with uh, Secretary of State Kissinger. Uh, and by the time that, that uh, Ford became president, he could have easily just washed his hands of the whole thing and said, let the chips fall where they may. There is no upside to me making crucial decisions here. Uh, there's no upside to me putting American military personnel at risk. But with the prospect of Saigon falling, and in addition to whatever American military and civilian personnel were there, but the thousands upon thousands of Vietnamese civilians who feared for their lives. They had served for years as, as drivers, as secretaries, as interpreters, uh, in many ways colleagues and, and, and co-workers with the Americans, that uh, there was, you couldn't really know what might happen to them. And so uh, President Ford w made that decision that we cannot abandon them. And we have to have this, what turned out to be the largest, and still to be, still is the largest helicopter evacuation operation in, in history. Uh, and that came under President Ford's watch. And, and I, I don't think it's a very, it's, that's, I don't think it's a bold statement to say that there are many, many people alive today, American and Vietnamese, uh, because of uh, what President Ford did and his, his, his resolve that, that uh, something had to be done, not only in the evacuation, but in the weeks and months afterwards. So I want to read something that actually appears towards the end of the book. And I don't do readings. You know, you'll, you'll be glad to know that you're not going to spend the next half hour or so with me just reading from the book. Uh, but there's two small things I want to read. One is going to be right now. And it actually takes place towards the end of the book. And I'll set the stage uh, very briefly. Uh, there, there were, uh, at the end of the evacuation, on the morning of April 30th, 1975, the, the sun had come up, 
and there were 11 Marines left on the roof of the American Embassy. Major James Keene is their commanding officer. You have Sergeant Juan Valdez, second in command, and you have nine uh, corporals and sergeants there. And uh, they are faced with a very desperate situation in that uh, surrounding the embassy are thousands of, um, of uh, South Vietnamese civilians, in some cases soldiers, who some of whom are very frightened about what's going to happen, some of whom are very angry that they have been seeing for hours helicopters come back and forth evacuating people, and none of these people are on them. Uh, you have 150,000 North Vietnamese troops who are entering the city. With uh, the, the, the Marines on top of the embassy roof can, can see and hear the tanks crossing the bridges. Uh, the, you have people who have broken into the embassy building. And what these Marines did is that as they were going up each flight of stairs, the six flights to get to the embassy roof, they set up barricades. And then they got to the roof, and there's no place else left to go. And the uh, Vietnamese people, some of the Vietnamese people who are very angry and upset, they have one by one broken through those barricades and gotten them to six flights. And now they're outside the, the door that leads to the embassy roof. And they're pounding on the door. It looks like very, very soon they're going to get through. And there's people going to come, they're going to come through. And the, the, uh, the 11 Marines are armed, of course, but you know there's 11 against thousands. And so uh, I'll read you this one scene because they, they have sort of a choice to make. And their choice is that at some point, and there's no, there's no helicopters in the sky. Nobody, as far as they're concerned, nobody's coming back for them. They're completely on their own. At some point, that door is going to come down. And when the, these people start streaming through the door, their choice is going to be, do we surrender? Do we throw down our guns, surrender? And maybe we'll be roughed up a little bit or taken hostage and eventually maybe exchanged? Uh, or do we lock and load and take as many of them with us as we can? So this is the, the, a scene where they have to make that decision. They had all heard the horrible stories from, uh, about North Vietnamese prison camps, the Hanoi Hilton, the tiger cages. Mike Sullivan th thought the, uh, the thoughts running through each man's mind. It wasn't supposed to end like this. Vietnam was supposed to be another Korea, a country divided in the middle. The southern half kept safe by an uneasy truce backed by American might. Better yet, he thought, we'd go back in and kick some communist ass. Drive them right back into China. Everyone, everybody bring it in, he said. One by one, the Marines gathered about him. Schlager was the first to break the tense silence. You think the fleet's even still out there? Of course it is, Sullivan said. Schlager gave him a look. Then what's taking them so long? I ain't ended up in no camp, Bennington said. He motioned toward one of the machine guns. I got my spot picked out. Then we'll die up here. It was Babel, the first words he'd uttered all morning. So be it, said Bobby Frayne. We better take a vote, Sullivan said. He had no doubt how it would come out, but he wanted to make it official. One by one, each man voted to fight. Keenan Valdez stood 30 feet away, watching. The two men eyed each other, the silence broken only by the muffled crumps of artillery now resonating from all directions. Keen knew the Marines would not ask for an officer's vote. The Corps was not a democracy. Valdez, however, was another matter. He may have been their commander and de facto leader, but he was still an enlisted man. The major jerked his chin. Go see what's up, top. Valdez reached the circle just as Bobby Frayne was finishing a speech. And so, anyway, that's what I say. His hand brushed the dog tags hanging from the thin metal chain around his neck. It may not be a long fight, but when they pull these off me, I want them to have to dig through a pile of corpses to get them. Valdez was struck by the matter-of-fact tone of Frayne's voice, by all of their voices. The sun was higher now, and the humidity weighed on top, on top sergeant like an anvil. All eyes were on him. Everyone else had voted to make a last stand, and his was the final ballot. Somebody had said that it had to be unanimous. What would everybody b back home think about what happened today? He also thought of his two sons. He raised his right hand. Aye, we fight, he said. So it became unanimous that uh, as, as, they, as they ended up uh, 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 terming it, uh, this was going to be their Alamo. Uh, they were going to take as many with them as they could when they came through that door. Now, I have to backtrack a little bit. How, how was it that at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning on April 30th, 1975, 
the evacuation of Saigon was concluded, everybody was getting out who was supposed to get out, that there were 11 Marines still up there. Uh, and I have to give a little bit of a backstory. The, the uh, Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 1973. Uh, what they called for, essentially, uh, was that the uh, North Vietnamese uh, would agree to a truce, uh, would not try to invade South Vietnam, and that they would uh, return American prisoners of war. They would also return as best they could the remains of, of, of uh, American servicemen who uh, had been killed and might, as far as we were concerned, missing in action, and so maybe bring some closure to families in the United States. Uh, on the part of the United States, uh, they were to withdraw their troops. Uh, they were only supposed to keep a few people there uh, at, at diplomatic missions, but our activity as far as military presence in, in South Vietnam was over. Uh, what would replace it is that we would supply the South Vietnamese government and military with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for guns and artillery and tanks and planes and helicopters and things like that. And uh, that was what Secretary of State Henry Kissinger came back with. This President Nixon was still president then, uh, came back with. And at, at the time, it was a great relief to the American people, many of whom were saying, enough of Vietnam. We, we, we want to move on. Vietnam already is history. Let's let it fade into history. Uh, you have to remember what the circumstances were, too. It, it, going into 1974, we were undergoing the, uh, uh, the trauma of the Watergate the scandal and investigation. And uh, we, there were some economic issues that we were trying to deal with. So uh, most Americans wanted to move on. Uh, what happened in 1974 is the North Vietnamese basically said, well, this is an opportunity. Uh, let's start moving our people down into South Vietnam. So they started moving supplies and troops to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, they started taking up strategic positions around certain cities. They started to apply pressure to the South Vietnamese military. And the, the strategy was to, you know what, let's, let's push a little bit and stop. Let's push a little bit and stop because we want to see if there had always been the threats had been made that if you, if you violate the Paris Peace Accords, well, we'll come back in. We'll send our troops back. We'll start bombing again. So the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese, uh, would, would push a little more, encroach a little more, do some more violations and then wait to see if there was any reaction, and there wasn't. Uh, in Washington, we had a transition. President Nixon resigned, Gerald Ford became president. He had tons on his plate. Uh, what the North Vietnamese decided at the end of 1974 is they developed a plan that would begin with what they would call their Great Spring Offensive in 1975, uh, that they were going to be able to, as they called it, reunite Vietnam. They were going to be able to take over South Vietnam. And uh, they would do it at some point in 1976, preferably before the, the 76 presidential elections in the United States. That's what they thought was their best case scenario. We can't do anything right away. Uh, so when the Great Spring Offensive began, uh, and it was led by a man named General Dung, who was, uh, had fought the French. He was their chief uh, military officer, uh, a, good, a very good strategist, uh, experienced fighter, uh, had the respect of, of uh, the Vietnamese, uh, gov North Vietnamese government. He was rather shocked as his forces started to go, uh, go into the Central Highlands and uh, into other cities, he was really quite surprised with how little resistance he was faced with. The resistance basically collapsed. You have to remember that the South Vietnamese government by this point was very fragile. Uh, without the American military presence, it was basically on its own. Uh, it's not no secret to say that there was a good, good amount of corruption going on in that government. And uh, a lot of the military forces found themselves without much support. And so the North Vietnamese would attack, and they would say, let's get out of here. We've got to save ourselves. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to paint all the South Vietnamese military with the same brush. There were, there were many, many very brave and courageous uh, officers and soldiers uh, who tried to put up a fight, but they were kind of outnumbered. And you have to remember, the North Vietnamese had enormous resources by this point. As I said, when, when, when General Dung had under his command 150,000 troops, who all could see the prize ahead of them. With every victory, they knew they were getting closer and doing it a lot faster than anybody expected. So they eventually get to the point where they are 
virtually surrounding Saigon. And uh, for most people, they are realizing Saigon doesn't have much time left. There's no way it can hold out. Now, there's, there's one per there is one person, one primary person, who is um, uh, not necessarily believing that, and that is um, the U.S. Ambassador to Saigon, Graham Martin. And uh, I, I happen to find Graham Martin a fascinating character, a man with a lot of virtues. Uh, he was an experienced diplomat. He'd uh, been uh, ambassador at uh, a diplomatic post in a lot of hot spots around the world. He continued to believe that there was a way that a truce could be worked out, that there was still a way that the South Vietnamese government could be saved, could remain in place. And he was the one that was giving these reports to President Ford and Secretary of State Kissinger. And that security circle that met regularly to monitor the growing crisis in South, in South uh, Vietnam, there's a, there's, in fact, there's a, a photo in the book of, of the security circle who include uh, uh, a couple of several familiar faces, including Dick Cheney as uh, one of them, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, and others uh, uh, were part of, this, part of this group. And I want to just want to read you two paragraphs uh, about Graham Martin that I think sort of describe him, the situation he was in. He, he was an intimidating figure, but he was also somebody who was uh, dealing with physical ailments and exhaustion and to, maybe you could even say a, a delusion as far as not being able to see and accept that you know the war is coming to a close and he can't fight, he can't resist really the, the, the pull of history that's going on here. Once a smart, eloquent conversationalist, as long it was said as he was the center of the conversation, Martin had lately become a surly man. His courtly North Carolina accent was now often slurred by the medications he took for both his walking pneumonia as well as injuries he sustained in a car accident. And he no longer spoke to people so much as spoke at them. As General Smith and Major Keene had seen this morning, his orders tended to escalate into harangues, and since his return to Vietnam, his health had seemed to deteriorate at a pace with the country. Although still tall and spare, his posture was now stooped and his cheeks hollowed and skein gray. The folds of his jowls had succumbed to gravity, and two dark smudges had settled permanently under his large, pale blue eyes, so bloodshot now that they appeared to be permanently weeping. He was 62 years old and could have passed for 75. Only his thick and perfectly quaffed white mane and the constant cigarette dangling in a jaunty angle from his cracked lips hinted at his former savoir faire. That and his still glowering stare, which as one aide remarked, could crack open an oyster. <laughs> he insisted that, uh, that there that the Americans not leave Saigon. He thought that would be a terrible signal, not only to just the people in Vietnam, but to people around the world who we counted as allies. What if we had made promises and we're showing that we're not going to keep them? And so he was an idealist in a lot. He was a practical man in some ways, but he was also an idealist in some other ways. And he was holding out for as long as possible to not a request that the evacuation begin. And then what, what tipped his hand, which, which made it impossible for him to, to uh, continue with his, what could be called a delusion, is that uh, the North Vietnamese commander, General Dung, had hesitated as he, when he surrounded Saigon. He could have taken the city in hours, but he hesitated because he didn't want any more bloodshed. Part of this was because he didn't want any more bloodshed. You know, he didn't, he didn't see the need for more people to die. The other reason was he was kind of concerned that if he went in and started killing people indiscriminately as he, his forces took over the city, that maybe the Americans would come back. You know, maybe that there would be uh, suddenly more boots on the ground. Maybe the bombings would resume, the B-52s would, would fly over. And so he, he allowed time, he stopped, and he, he sort of, well, he didn't say this to anybody among, except among his own officers, but he sort of sent these signals saying, get out now while you can, I will let you go. You know, I will let you get everybody out that you want to get out, but just get started, just do it. And it wasn't happening. So finally he said, you know what, I gotta send a message. 
So he decided that he would have his artillery bombard Tansanut Air Base and uh, throw some bombs in there, blow up some planes, blow up some oil tanks, some, some ammunition, whatever, put on a display, let them know that, you know, my patience is wearing thin. And that's what he did. And this was about 4 o'clock in the morning on April 29th. Uh, unfortunately, one of those bombs hit a, uh, a, a, a guard station there that was occupied by two U.S. Marines. Darwin Judge and Charles McMahon, very 19 and 21 years old, young men, uh, two of the Marine security guards. Uh, they had actually been sent there by their commanding officer, Sergeant Juan Valdez, because he thought they would be safer there. They were new in country, and they, he wanted to keep them safe. He, they, the sergeant even writ, written letters to their parents saying, they are here, I'm taking them under my wing, I'll take care of them. So he sends them out to the airport, just you know, st stay there, stay out of harm's way, and a bomb finds them and they were killed instantly. The, uh, uh, that was basically, if you have Marines dead, you can't just keep holding out and doing nothing. So finally, also under the pressure of, of President Ford and, and, and Secretary of State Kissinger, uh, uh, Graham Martin said, okay, we have to initiate our evacuation plan. And so it was put into effect. And there's sometimes kind of a surreal humor to this. Uh, the, uh, in a couple of ways. One, the, op the, the plan that was to be put into effect was called Operation Frequent Wind. Uh, you know, it could, have been, it could have been something, I think, a little more uh, commanding about that title. Uh, the other thing was that uh, somebody cooked up the idea that, that uh, we have to send a signal out through the city so that people are knowing that the operation has been implemented journalists, American civilian and military personnel, Vietnamese civilians uh, and officials, so that they know that to go to certain designated areas where buses will pick them up or get to the DAO, Defense Attaché's office compound in uh, the airport, or especially get to the American Embassy. As Major James Keene says, you know, when there's trouble, people run to the American flag. And they have to know the time has come, you know, put this plan into effect. And they wanted to do it like in a subtle way that's kind of under the radar, so maybe the general population wouldn't know about it. So somebody cooked up the idea that uh, at 11 o'clock that morning, now we're talking about Saigon on April 29th, it's 98 degrees. Somebody had the idea that what, they, what blared out of the loud, loudspeakers was Bing Crosby singing, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. <laughs> yeah, nobody noticed something strange going on, that they're singing about Christmas and it's 98 degrees in April. But that's what happened, and everybody started heading to the, most of the people started heading for the U.S. Embassy. I'm going to put that on hold just for a second because there's another uh, uh, important uh, part of this story. Uh, there was a consulate south, southwest of Saigon called Canto, and the head of the consulate there was a man named Francis Terry. Everybody called him Terry McNamara. And uh, he uh, had been told of the plans of what was going to happen and when the evacuation was. And he had uh, a contingent of five Marines. He had his own uh, civil American civilian personnel who worked for the consulate. And he also had uh, a couple of two, three hundred uh, South Vietnamese civilians who he had promised, when we have to leave, you, you will come with us. Because these were people that had worked for them or another, and their families and feared for their lives. And uh, he had been allotted, he had been given four helicopters, that uh, four large, large helicopters that when the time came, take his people out of there, or as many of them as could fit. And uh, so that's what happened. He gets the word, Operation Frequent Winners Effect, you gotta go. But before this, Nakamara is a very bright guy. He had been in other hot spots himself, too. He had a, a real love. He was kind of a jaunty, confident, cool, calm, and collected customer. And he said, you know what? You always have to have a plan B. You know, don't depend, what is it, you know, uh, hope for the best but plan for the worst? Well, he lived that philosophy. So he actually uh, got together a couple of old barges, and he had them supplied with some food, some ammunition, and some other things. And he said, just in case. So sure enough, the time comes, Operation Frequent Wind is going into effect. He goes down to where the helicopters are supposed to be, they're gone. It turns out that uh, during the night, the CIA had taken them to escape themselves. <laughs> So they're safe back in the 7th Fleet out there, but there's no helicopters. So McNamara and his, the head of his contingent, uh, Sergeant Stephen Hastie, Steve Hastie, 
uh, he, uh, they get all their people on the barges, and uh, somebody even made up for, for uh, McNamara helmet he put on that says Cantho Yacht Club. And uh, at, at noon that day, they set off from, from the dock and they head down this tributary of, of, of the uh, Mekong River and uh, to head out, hoping that they could just wa work their way around and maybe get out to the open sea where they expect the Navy's going to be there and pick them up. And, and that's what they do. And they, they get uh, to a certain point where they're going around the bend in the river and all of a sudden, fire erupts from the Viet Cong from that side. And there's Hasty and his men firing back, so there's a firefight going on. They get past that, another bend, another firefight breaks out. They get, they get past that, and it seems like they're gonna be safe for a while, and all of a sudden, some South Vietnamese boats come and stop them with all kinds of troops on them. And they're told, McNamara is told that uh, you can't go any further. We're going to search every, your boats and everything. And if we find any Vietnamese men of soldier age, we're taking them with us. And McNamara says, no, these people are under my protection. They're coming with me. There's a standoff. And all this while, you know, Hasty, he's got, he's got a gun under a burlap bag. And his other men have got their guns hidden because they think if, if it hits the fan suddenly, we're going to come out firing. But McNamara, cool and calm, he goes to the guy, he says, get me your com Colonel so-and-so, your commanding officer. And he and stares him down, and the guy does, takes a half hour, and uh, Colonel so-and-so shows up, and he says, Colonel, I think there's been a misunderstanding here. And the Colonel says, how so? He said, well, um, you might remember how a couple of weeks ago I personally signed the exit visas for you and your, your wife and your children <laughs> to leave Vietnam, and right now your wife and children are in Guam. And the colonel says, that is quite a misunderstanding. And he goes to his troops, let them go, let them go. <laughs> and on they go down the river. So I'm going to leave them heading down the river and come back to uh, what's going on in Saigon. Um, the, the, uh, around the embassy compound, the US embassy compound, more and more people are gathering around the gates. And what's happening is that these helicopters are coming from the Seventh Fleet. And they're flying, and they're landing on in the courtyard of the embassy and on the roof of the embassy. And uh, it's been set up that uh, uh, American civilian uh, personnel and Vietnamese civilians, those that have the, the right documents and papers and everything, they're being put on these helicopters as fast as possible. The helicopters are taking off. Another one takes its place. This one after another, after another, after another. Uh, one of our main characters is a fellow named Captain Jerry Berry. And it's kind of an amusing name, but there, you couldn't have found a tougher guy uh, in this role. He ended up, uh, out of the 20 hours of this operation, spending 18 and a half in the air. He would drop, his, drop the people off, no time for food or sleep or anything like that. I'm going out again. Off he goes. He goes. And I should mention that this wasn't just like a moseying out to Saigon and back. Uh, they were under rocket fire and small arms fire from the North Vietnamese uh, who, wanted to re, who wanted to remind the Americans, listen, your time is numbered. We're not waiting forever. So we're not going to let you unmolested go back and forth. You waited this long. You know, we, we gave you a chance to leave. So, uh, what's trying to keep order out of chaos in this, Amer in this American embassy compound are the Marine security guards. Some of you may already be familiar with who, who the Marine security guards are and what they do. They've been around since the late 1940s. And they're now found in over 140 embassies uh, around, the, around the world. Uh, they are the ones who are charged with protecting American diplomats and uh, embassy personnel, uh, classified material. Uh, if, if you don't know about them or never hear about them, that means they're doing their job right. They're not there to, to create headlines. They're not there to call attention to themselves. They're, they're an elite, uh, they're the elite of the elite. Uh, you have to be selected to be a Marine security guard. You go to a Marine security guard school in Quantico, Virginia, and there's a 30% attrition rate. Uh, so that means only seven out of every 10 graduate. Uh, they are especially bright people because uh, they're, they're, there's so much they have to know about the, the embassies and, and classified documents and, and dealing with the personalities. They, they, they are the only, they don't report, they're the only group of Marines that don't report to the you know, Marine commanders. They, they uh, report to the State Department. And so they have to know how to handle State Department and bureaucracy and things like that, which takes brains. Um, 
So in our case, uh, we have uh, some of our, our characters who are going to end up on the roof are part of this group of 50 or 60 Marine security guards who are manning the gates, manning the perimeter of the American Embassy as the crowd grows and the crowd gets more fearful and more angry as they see one helicopter after another coming back and forth, taking people out of there, none of whom are the ones on the outside of the gates. Oops, excuse me. And so at, at, at uh, you know, Major James Keene is their commanding officer. Uh, he had served a tour of duty uh, in, in country in the Vietnam War. Uh, I mentioned Sergeant Juan Valdez, Valdez, a career Marine, a Marine's Marine, uh, hailed from San Antonio. Uh, we have guys like uh, Bobby Frain and, and, and Bobby Schlager and Mike Sullivan and Steve Schuler, uh, Philip Babel, Steve Bauer, uh, Dave Norman. Uh, these are guys, uh, but there's others too who are surrounding, uh, uh, banning, banning the embassy walls. And at one point, uh, what they're at one point what they're doing is uh, there are people showing up that are showing the correct papers. But how do you how do you get them into the embassy grounds? You can't just open a door and say after you, uh, because after you means after thousands. <laughs> So at one point, uh, there's one Marine, uh, uh, Big John Gillane, uh, who is a big husky guy, and uh, uh, to this day, he's, he's a, a cop in Boston. And uh, uh, Sergeant Valdez stands on his shoulders and reaches over the gates, and he starts pulling people up, one after another, pulling people up like this. You know, he's obviously a strong guy, uh, but that's not too effective because it's pretty time consuming. And then at one point, there's two women there, and they're, they're in the crowd, and they also are showing the proper documents and saying, let us in, let us in. And uh, it's, the, the decision's made this one time, let's open up the gate, and we'll form a phalanx, and we'll go out there, and they do that, and they actually have to, the, the crowd is preventing these women from being, they actually have to grab them by their hair and pull them through the gates and the Marines back up and just as the gates are being closed, just as they're being closed, one South Vietnamese uh, soldier with a, with a rifle and with a bayonet on the end of it, he sticks it right into Steve Schuler into his side. And so he goes down. Uh, and uh, as, as, as uh, Terry Bennington uh, clocks the guy with the, with the butt of his, of his, of his gun, and does not know if he killed him or not, but he certainly put him out of action. And, uh, and, and immediately, uh, Schuler was bleeding from his side. Uh, he's told, uh, we're getting you on the next helicopter. And no way. He's, he, 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 takes, he takes a rag and he sticks it in a hole in his side. And he says, I'm not leaving my brothers. I'm staying here with the, with the rest of them. And sure enough, he doesn't. Uh, he's, he ends up being one of the last 11 on the roof. So this is going on all during the afternoon and all into the evening and all during the night. You know, when the night comes, they, they put the trucks around the courtyard, the embassy, with headlights on to keep illuminating the, uh, the landing area. And up on the embassy roof, they have these the, the glow lights, and, and Dave Norman is up there, and Steve Bauer, and their helicopters are coming in. I mean, these pilots are doing just a tremendous job, the skill that it took. Uh, to be under fire, going back and going back in, landing on the roof, uh, packing people in there, taking off again. And there comes a point where out on the fleet, an admiral makes a decision, and this is about 11 o'clock or so that night, he says, you know, we've got to cut the operations short. We've got to stop the operations. It's too dangerous. It's pitch dark. The pilots have to be exhausted. Uh, there's Air Force and Marine Corps pilots doing it. And uh, it's, it's just too dangerous. So he gives out the command, cease the re evacuation. We'll resume in the morning. Well, Major Keene gets, hears about this, and he goes to his immediate commander out in the fleet, uh, General Richard Carey, and says, we can't do this. The, the morning is too late. There is no morning as far as this operation is concerned. And so uh, the, the next guy in command is General Wilson, Marine uh, General Wilson. He hears about this, and he tells the admirals on the fleet, he says, I will personally court-martial any officer who stops this operation while there's still Marines in Saigon. Well, that loosens things up a bit. <laughs> Next, about, about a half hour later, Major Keene starts hearing those helicopter the rotors going again. The evacuation resumes. They're they're, by, by this point, literally thousands of people have been uh, evacuated. Still, there are still hundreds more in the courtyard. So all through the night, 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, this is going on. 
increasing pressure on the gates outside. Uh, the Marines you know, holding back, the, literally with their hands, holding the gates closed, holding the crowd back. And it becomes clear that there's, only, there's very little time left. And so uh, President Ford makes the decision, let's do 20 more flights, and we've got to make sure on the last flight out that, we, that Graham Martin is on that flight. And the, the, that was important, very important because Graham Martin, he, he vowed he would die at his desk, basically. Uh, he didn't want to be evacuated. He wanted to, uh, Henry Kissinger was the one who made, I was so glad when, when I found this, this dial, this line by Henry Kissinger. He said, I don't want Graham Martin pulling a Chinese Gordon. And what he meant by that, some of you may be familiar with General Charles Chinese Gordon, the British uh, commander, uh, who was in Khartoum when it fell to the uh, army of Muslims in the 1880s. Uh, some of you may recall they made a movie about it called Khartoum with Charlton Heston and Laurence Olivier back in the 60s. Uh, he stayed there because he wanted to show, he wanted to be the representation the British government would not abandon our allies. And so that's what Graham Martin wanted to do. We're not going to abandon our allies. And if I have to die here to show that, then I will do that. But the President Ford and Kissinger realized we can't let one of our ambassadors be killed. We can't let him be, even worse, perhaps, we can't let him be captured. We can't let him be trotted out on dis displayed by the conquering North Vietnamese forces that we've got one of their ambassadors. How humiliating would that be? So the order goes out, that last helicopter better contain Ambassador Martin. So uh, that, uh, that order is given to, it's relayed to Jerry Berry, Captain Berry, who's about to make one more trip to the fleet. He's told when you get there, if you have to, you go into his office and you pick up the ambassador, you tie him up if you have to, and throw him on your helicopter. So Berry lands on the roof of the American Embassy. He's met my Major Keene. And, um, he says, I'm here to get the ambassador. I got to take him out, take him out to the fleet. And Major Keene says, he's not going to go. I'm telling you. And, and Barry says, well, uh, I, I, that the president has so ordered. And Keene says, well, you know, where's the order? You got to show me something. So Barry says, oh, I got it right here, basically. And he turns over. He takes out a, a white knee pad from behind his seat, takes out a magic marker. He writes some scribbles on it. He puts it up on, on his window. He says, this is President Ford's written order. <laughs> and Keene sort of winks at him and says, good enough for me. <laughs> they go downstairs. They get the ambassador. They grab him. They bring him upstairs. They put him on the helicopter with however many is, else they could fit on there. And the helicopter takes off. The last thing that Keene says to, uh, uh, to Jerry Berry is, uh, is, is don't leave us here. It's the last thing he says. So Barry takes off. He has to go through the fire and everything. And, and as he leaves, and he, it's, he's still not feet wet. He's still over Saigon. But he's sort of out of harm's way. So he radios back to the fleet the prearranged signal. He said, the, the, tiger, the tiger is out. The tiger is out. That was to let the fleet know that he had the ambassador. Okay. Unfortunately, at the fleet, they interpreted that to mean that with the ambassador were the last American military personnel on that helicopter, and that everybody was out. And that's how they interpreted it. So they ended Operation Frequent Wind. It ceased to operate. There were no more, no more helicopters were authorized uh, to head back to Saigon. And um, it was when Jerry Berry uh, 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 got to back on the, on the uh, the aircraft carrier that uh, and he saw there was no activity. There was no more landings or anything like that. He said, what's going on? He said, we got everybody out. And Captain Berry says, uh, wait a minute. I got something to tell you guys. Meanwhile, back on the roof of the American embassy, these 11 guys, time goes by. Sun has come up. There's nobody coming back. There's no more activity. Skies are clear. Again, and they could see that the, across the bridges into Saigon and the tanks and the 150,000 North Vietnamese troops. It's Vietnamese people, the angry Vietnamese people, including some soldiers, they've gotten, they ransacked the embassy. They have guns and everything now. They're right outside the door, banging their, their way in. That door is going to come down any moment. So these 11 guys who were voted to die, lock and load, and we'll take them with us when we go, 
Uh, one of them opens a knapsack, he takes out a bottle of Johnny Walker Red, a bottle of Johnny Walker Black, and they, they take off the cap and they pass one bottle around and finish it, and they pass the other bottle around and finish it. And they're sitting there, some of them are talking a little bit to each other, some of them have their private thoughts, you know, uh, Dave Norman's thinking about he wished he could see his parents one more time in Ohio, and John Valdez is thinking about his two sons. And, Major Keene, uh, the week before, had gotten a radio transmission that his wife was pregnant with their third child. And a couple of the other fellows are thinking about the, the brotherhood of being a Marine, and if, if they're going to die, this is how they want to do it. And uh, that door is about to come down, and these are the last 11 Marines left on the roof. And uh, if you want to find out what happens, you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> So, any questions? Uh, one quick question, and perhaps it's more of a detail. I've read somewhere, I thought it was in the New York Times, that the uh, last evacuees did not come from the roof of the American Embassy, but rather at an adjoining uh, building, which my wife and I had seen, you can, present, I think you can see it from the Caravel Hotel, mm -hmm. with a water tower type arrangement up at the top of the roof. Yeah. That may be mistaken, but uh, if you could clarify that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think what you're referring to is that iconic photograph that so many of yes. us have, have a memory of that would appear in the- Going up the last- Yeah, yeah. that appeared on the very front page of the New York Times and, in, and newspapers all around the world. And uh, most of us uh, have, have spent the last, uh, those of us that are old enough, have spent the last 36 years thinking that what we were told basically, that that was the last helicopter out of Saigon. And uh, however, it was not. Uh, and and we, actually, we do have that photograph in the book and we explain what happened. Uh, at about two o'clock in the afternoon of, of, of April 29th, uh, there was a helicopter that landed on the roof of the, the building is actually the Pittman Apartments. And it was, uh, it was in that apartment building, there was, a, there was a top floor, if I remember correctly, were used as, as CIA offices. And um, there was a man named O.B. Harnage, who was a CIA operator, who knew that there were Vietnamese civilians who they had promised they were, were gonna not leave behind when the time came. So he actually commandeered a helicopter and flew and landed on the Pittman apartment buildings and was, was hurting people, hurting people onto the helicopter to save their lives. Uh, so one for the CIA, um, but it was kind of a rogue operation. He was doing it all on his own. And uh, this photographer, Hubert Van Es, uh, Dutch photographer, was, um, uh, was told, hey, look at that, because it, it is a pretty remarkable sight, you know, if you remember that, the little tiny top of that building. And he took that photograph, and then uh, he sent it out uh, to, he wrote a caption for it, which was the correct caption, and he sent it out, transmitted it, and somehow the caption and the, and the image got separated so that a lot of places around the country, like AP and Reuters and UPI and places like that, got only the photograph. And they're hearing on their radios and teletypes and stuff that Saigon is falling. They made the assumption that that was the last helicopter out of Saigon that was, had landed on the roof of the American Embassy. And it was actually these 11 Marines you know, that I'm talking about on the roof of the American Embassy, that was 15 hours after that photograph was taken. So it's kind of a little bit of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, interesting history that, that what we've come to think was the, the last helicopter actually wasn't. So I'm, I, I wasn't necessarily gonna, gonna, gonna bring it up because you know, people can find out for themselves, but uh, thanks for bringing it up. And, and I did not plant you in the audience, right? We, we don't know each other. I got a free book out of that. Thanks again for Thank you. a very fine presentation and also for uh, clarifying that for us. Thank you very much. Next, anybody else have a, have a, a question? Please bring him on. My name's Dale Thronberry with uh, Veterans Radio. Oh, hello, Dale. How you doing? I'm great. I did get a free book. <laughs> <laughs> hey, keep it to yourself, will you? <laughs> Well, for those of you who don't know, Dale Thronberry is the host every Saturday morning of Veterans Radio. Yep, uh, here great locally. Pro great program, and, and it's a, a broadcast from here in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Right, it's uh, WDEO, and we mm -hmm. have Tom and his other partner, Bob. Uh, we did an interview with them 
on the 30th of April, mm -hmm. I believe it was. Yes, it was. And so if uh, this is a paid political announcement. <laughs> if you want to listen to the interview, yeah. you, you can go to Veterans Radio and listen to our archives. It's in there. Yeah. But what I wanted to talk about was the confusion that seemed to reign supreme there. I, had, um, I was in Vietnam in 1969 as a helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. And I'd landed on the embassy. Mm -hmm. Which is the the landing pad is smaller than much smaller than this room, mm. and I was amazed at how these large helicopters were able to get in and out. Yeah, and you know all of us think of the iconic pictures of the aircraft being pushed off of aircraft carriers and so mm -hmm. on uh, during the war. Those were not American helicopters. Those were South mm -hmm. Vietnamese helicopters that were being piloted out there by the South Vietnamese pilots to get out. Mm -hmm. And they were landing on anything that had a flat surface. Right, right. Yeah, exactly what was happening is that you had some South Vietnamese officers and officials who had access to helicopters and they would just take them and fly themselves out to, out to the fleet and land on the aircraft carriers and without permission, without clearing anything with anybody, just to save themselves and perhaps their families or others with them. And what the uh, what the Navy personnel had to do was literally push these things off to the side, uh, off the side into the ocean to make room for the American military helicopters who were coming back with, with evacuees. And there, are, there are some great pictures in the book. Right? Yeah. You know, of the characters that he was talking about. And we had the opportunity of talking not only with the authors, but also with Steve. Um, Steve Schuler. Schuler. Yeah, he's the fellow who got the program. bayonet in the side. And uh, he's, he's a hoot. Yeah. All, <laughs> all these Marines are great. And it was, a, it was an honor, a privilege for me to serve with these types of men and women, too. So thank yeah, you very much for doing this book. Well, thank you. And thank you for, for mentioning about, about Steve Schuler and, and the others, because as, as we, you know, as you saw or heard when we were doing this interview, with, uh, with Dale on, on the Veterans Radio. Um, Steve Schuler, I think, is pretty typical. He certainly had an opportunity there to blow his own horn, you know, and, and to refer to himself in any way he wanted to as a hero uh, because of what he did, uh, you know, in his military career, but especially those that last 24 to 48 hours. But uh, even when asked about taking that bayonet, you know, it was like, yep, yeah, that hurt, but uh, you know, <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't going to leave the other guys, you know, and that, and that, that was that was the biggest pat on the back he gave himself. And and I, I definitely have to mention that I was, I found and read those cables here at the library, um, and and I I it was interesting to see that he was try he and Henry Kissinger seemed to have on the one hand a warm relationship, of and, and seemed to have I've got your back, you've got my back dialogue going on, but you could also see that each one was trying to maneuver the other. You know, Graham Martin was not being completely truthful with President Ford and with Secretary of State Kissinger. He seemed to be minimizing how dangerous the situation was getting and how fast it was deteriorating. On the other hand, uh, Secretary of State Kissinger could realize that this thing was going south very quickly and it could be a total disaster. And there's got to be a fall guy. And, he, and Martin, you're, you're going to be it. You know? and, and so uh, I, I thought the cables were fascinating. I, I, the, I would have loved to, uh, the book is not a long book. I think it's about 304 pages. Certainly if we had included more of the behind the scenes story of what was going on in the White House. And, uh, and, and a lot of the, the dialogue back and forth, it would have been a longer book. We just felt it would have gotten off the focus, which we really wanted to be on the Marines. But, but it's, it's a fascinating part of, of that whole story that what was going on between Graham Martin and, and, and Washington was like this, this diplomatic dance. And each one was, in a way, looking at each, at, at each other as, you know, well, if so, when it hits the fan, if somebody's going to take the blame, it's going to be you. No, it's going to be you. No, it's going to be you. you know? And they went back and forth. And they, on the other hand, I do think that Secretary of State Kissinger, um, uh, he, and he might have made an error during this that he tried, to, he tried to stick by Martin as long as he could because he was not in Saigon at the time Martin was. So he, it wasn't like he was an omniscient and say, well, he's telling me this and I know he's wrong. How could he know he's wrong? He, 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 Martin worked for him and he had to, to a lot, in a lot of ways, trust his judgment and his, his, what he was reporting from the scene. Yes. Yes, sir. There were rumors that there were some Americans still left in Saigon after the helicopters took off, some of them being uh, married to civilians. Mm -hmm. Were any of those true? Was that part of your book? 
Uh, what, what he's asking is that uh, in a, after the helicopter operation was over, there were still Americans left in Saigon, um, maybe those who had ma been married to, to civilians. And it's, it's not part of the book. Uh, along the way, we, we talked to some people who, who said that, I mean, the top priority is that if you were uh, an American civilian or military, you were married to a Vietnamese person. In almost all cases, it was a, a Vietnamese woman. Uh, to, to try and, and get her out, in some cases get her and her family out. Uh, the, uh, uh, Mike Sullivan, I think it was, was married to a Vietnamese woman and, uh, and kind of an interesting irony. Uh, in the chaos of the last few days, uh, it, was, it was difficult even to, 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 to get your wife out, you know, and, and uh, because of documentation and bureaucracy and red tape and stuff like that. And at one point he was over at the airport trying to see, you know, his wife was there and, and any way somebody could get her on a plane, get her on a helicopter or whatever. And, uh, and I can't remember, it was, I, it was either Judge or McMahon who was there on that detail at the airport came forward and said, let me do something for you. And he did what he had to do. He filled out some kind of form. He rubber stamped it. He stuck it under some officer's pen, you know, sign this like this and got the, his wife on the plane to and, and to the United States to safety, and uh, they're still married to this day. Uh, and like 48 hours later, he was dead. You know, so so uh, not really part of the research, not really part of the book. Uh, you could probably figure that there were some uh, American men who decided to stay. There were certainly journalists who stayed. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they, they all got out and tried to bring their spouses, and if they had children, uh, tried to bring them with them and, and uh, bring them back to the States. Because really, you know, we now know that there was no ge genocide, there was no uh, ons murderous onslaught when the North Vietnamese did come into uh, uh, Saigon. Um, nothing like, what, like the, the Pol Pot regime when the Khmer Rouge took over. Uh, but, uh, but they couldn't know that then. You know, what they had been told for, for years was that when the, if, they, if they take over South Vietnam, you'll, Vietnam, you'll all be dead, you know, or you'll all be in prison. So those that had any, any chance of getting, getting out, getting out uh, uh, got out. Uh, you know, their, their, their chances of surviving, they figured, were very small if they stayed. Another question. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, an example of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the CIA. Uh, in effect, foiling the commitments that an officer <clears throat> had made to his own people and to some of the Vietnamese. Uh, you also mentioned that in another case, uh, the, the CIA had control of helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, were there other examples of this sort of the chain of command breaking down or of conflict in interlocking chains of command, especially with respect to the CIA interfering with the military? There, we, we deal with that to some, a limited extent in the book, because again, we wanted the focus to be on the Marines, but within the American Embassy in Saigon, there was a lot of uh, discussion. I mean, nobody actually could challenge Graham Martin's authority. He was the head person, he was the ambassador, he headed the U.S. Embassy. But uh, the, the CIA, many of the CIA knew what was going on. They could see it, it was pretty obvious. They didn't need the most brilliant intelligence to tell them that Saigon was lost. You know, it was beyond saving. There was nothing to stop North Vietnamese invading forces and with it basically the tide of history. Uh, you know, one of the CIA operatives there until the very end was a man named Frank Snepp. And so that name may ring a bell for some of you because he came out with a book called Indecent Interval in the 1970s, only like a year or two after Saigon fell. And one of the reasons why that book was controversial uh, is because he does discuss the turmoil and the conflicting opinions uh, that were going on inside the American embassy towards the end. So while nobody could overrule anything that Graham Martin ordered, uh, certainly the uh, the CIA could, could, could see which way the wind was blowing, and they realized that they had to get out, they had to get their families out, and uh, they were not necessarily part of Operation Frequent Wind, but in some cases, like with this guy, O.B. Harnage, he took matters into his own hands. He knew he had an opportunity, even if it was just one helicopter he commandeered, that he could save some lives, and he did. So in a lot of ways, individual CIA agents uh, did a lot of brave things those last 24 to 48 hours. Yes, sir. 
I'm wondering what future books you're currently working on. Well, um, uh, and of quite a different departure, I am working on a biography of the baseball player and manager Gil Hodges, <laughs> uh, which is a very uh, different story. Uh, but Bob Drury and I uh, are, are uh, working on our fourth book together. Uh, the first one, Halsey's Typhoon, the second one being The Last Stand of Fox Company, which is the story of a Marine Corps company in Korea in November 1950. Again, a story most people don't know, but it's, it's sort of like uh, uh, three, the story of 300 Spartans, but with the American Marines uh, playing that role. And this book, and we're actually working on a book on a, uh, a Sioux war chief called Red Cloud, uh, who uh, in, in the 1860s, uh, controlled uh, under his uh, uh, con command, basically, uh, a, a total of one-fifth of the continental United States. And he was the first, only, la last and only uh, uh, Native American uh, war chief to win a war uh, with the U.S. government. Uh, and that, that the U.S. government actually sued him for peace. And it's kind of, again, kind of an untold story, uh, what a remarkable person he was. Uh, he was born in 1822. He died in 1909. His, his life spans so much of the American West and what happened to it. And that's what we're working on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Suggestion. Yes. Uh, WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, believe me, as, as we sit here, there's probably 15 to 20 or more writers with contracts in their hands doing books on <laughs> WikiLeaks right now. And plus, you probably have to have, be smarter than I am to understand all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, my other suggestion is on Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Don't call it last man out, though. No, no, because we don't, we don't know if there's going to be a last man out there. That's right. <laughs> Ten maybe, years from now, we're still going to be waiting for him. Maybe you could call it hurricane. Yeah, yeah. OK. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. For a very interesting talk and all Thanks the research that uh, goes into it, I was wondering: Do you have any details about how many helicopters there were, and how many passengers each helicopter could take? Average? Well, there were there were a couple of different helicopters. There was uh, I, I want to just make sure I have it correct for you, and I have it right here. Uh, there was a CH-53 Sea Stallion. Bless you. Uh, there, there were, and there was a CH-46 Sea Knight. Those were the two different kinds of helicopters. And the, the, the larger one, what they did is the people who were waiting in the, in the courtyard of the American Embassy, they would divide them up into what they call sticks, which would be like maybe 50 people each. And each time a helicopter landed, they, because they figured that was the average amount of people they could fit in each one, and they would, it varied. You know, if you had more children that particular load, you could fit more people because they were smaller. Uh, and they, they pushed them into the, into the, uh, into the helicopter. Um, and I just want to see if I can get it exactly right for you because I have it right here. Um, Given the crowded skies above Saigon, General Dung's intelligence officers proved remarkably accurate in their assessment of what many were already referring to as the American Dunkirk. U.S. Marine helicopter pilots flew 682 sorties into Saigon during Operation Frequent Wind, a total of 395 Americans and 4,475 Vietnamese and third country nationals were evacuated from the defense attach attaché's office with another 978 Americans and 1,220 Vietnamese and others rescued from the U.S. Embassy. Altogether, over 7,000 people were lifted out of the city before it was occupied by North Vietnamese troops and the Viet Cong. 420 people were left behind. So it's terrible for those 420 people who were left behind, but we're talking about over basically a 20 hour, 20, 19, 20 hour period that over 7,000 people were evacuated. And as I mentioned, it remains uh, the largest helicopter evacuation operation that was ever done. And the reason why we refer in the subtitle as America's heroic final hours in Vietnam is that uh, certainly enough of us have experienced or heard over the years, over the decades, that we don't want to talk about Vietnam and it was not a good war, it was a war that we essentially lost, things like that. We wanted to tell the story because at the very end, our last involvement in Vietnam was really a great success. I mean, the, the heroism of the pilots, of the Marine security guards, of some of the, some of the diplomats and some of the American officials on the ground, uh, that over 7,000 lives were saved in a short period of time under the most trying and dangerous conditions 
uh, it really was heroic, and it really was, you know, if you, it, our, our final experience in Vietnam was one that really we could all be proud of. Yes, sir. Um, just to follow up on that question, why was this a helicopter dependent evacuation? What happened to the US Navy? That's a, the that's a really good question. There were actually, the helicopter evacuation was actually like Plan C. Uh, plan A was to use fixed wing aircraft that were going to land at the airport and a couple other places as the C-130s and you could pack a lot of people onto them. And in addition to that, or in place of that in case it was a problem, in addition to that, the Navy was going, were going to send uh, ships and boats up, up and, and we were supposed to put people on these boats and bring them out to the, to the Seventh Fleet where they would eventually be taken to Guam and other places like that. What happened was when the, uh, when the, when, when the airport was, was bombed, the runways were basically became useless. There were you know, craters there and everything. You could not land. Martin himself went out to the airport to investigate, and even he was convinced, we can't use the airport anymore. We can't land planes there. And because the situation deteriorated so quickly, there was no time for the Navy. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a, a pretty laborious operation to send the boats in, get people collected there, load them onto boats, go back out again, plus whatever kind of fire, artillery and otherwise, those boats would have been subjected to. So what happened was because we waited, we or Ambassador Martin, whoever, waited so long to initiate the evacuation, the only choice left were these helicopters that could fly very fast, come in, bang, pick up people, and leave. And as long as you could, keep them in the sky, have them keep going back and forth, which is what they did. So plan C was the least desirable of the options, but it became the only one still available. Yes, sir. Earlier in your speech, Tom, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the uh, commanders, I believe it was, had three or four hundred people on barges going down the river. Yes. And you left them there. <laughs> I'm glad you were listening. <laughs> Well, what happened was they, uh, they kept making their way down the river. Darkness fell. Uh, they uh, got to the open sea, and there was no Navy. Uh, and so they were there bobbing. And these barges, we're talking about barges that were not you know, were in bad shape, so, and overloaded barges. So they were worried these things were at one point just going to fall apart. Uh, and finally, a, 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 a ship comes along. It was actually a commercial freighter comes along. Uh, that was looking for, for stragglers. And there were a few Marines on board, and they see these barges loom there in the darkness, and uh, they, they're worried about pirates. So they get a little closer, and the Marines on the freighter suddenly go over with their guns, you know, thinking they're gonna blow these pirates away. The Marines, Steve Hasty and his guys on the barges hear the, hear the lock and load, they go up like this. And fortunately, one guy shouted to another, you know, Joe DiMaggio or something like that. And, uh, you know, Marines, Marines, Marines. And, uh, and eventually everybody, McNamara brought everybody home safe. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad to report he's, he's alive and well, lives in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, he's got his, he came out with a book uh, uh, some years ago, and I think it was called Escape with Honor, that goes into a lot more detail about his adventures. And I certainly recommend it. He's, he's, he's an amazing guy, and he actually pulled off an operation that he just would just stuck together at the last minute that was a lot of smoke and mirrors. But, but his kind of cool, calm, and collected demeanor kept everybody together. Even, even a lot of the Vietnamese civilians were very frightened, but they looked at him and said, well, he's not panicking. I guess we won't either. Yes, sir. Hi, I uh, just finished taking a course on the history of America's involvement in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and a lot of the end of the course focused on like the shame and embarrassment of kind of sneaking out in the night and leaving uh, the South Vietnamese officials and people who worked closely with the Americans high and dry. Um, so I appreciate you having a different perspective, if I'm reading you correctly, and in the sense that uh, you know every effort was made to save as many people as possible is kind of what I'm getting. And correct me if, if I'm wrong. No, I, well, I'm glad you brought that point up because that was a motivation for doing the book. That th there is, you know, there's something to be said about th did we, you know, fulfill our commitments. But what seems to have been completely overlooked is that uh, there were quite a few people in, uh, who put their own lives in danger 
to fulfill those commitments as best they could, and they had to sort of improvise on the ground. Uh, these these Marines, you know, they they when, when things were threatening to descend into chaos, they had to improvise and they had to do the best they could, and and that story should be told too. That that should be part of the history class. Right. Well, well, I appreciate your perspective, and that kind of leads me to my question. So the the last eleven that were left on the roof had made the decision to essentially fight it out with the mm -hmm. people who hours previously they were making an effort to save and doing everything they could to save these people. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the chaos and the way things ended up, they're essentially locked and loaded, ready to fight it out with these people. Um, and, you know, in your dealings with them, how do they kind of come to terms with that and how do they feel about seeing the people that they weren't able to help kind of on the way out the door? Well, they, they uh, first of all, they are very proud of, of what they did. You know, some of you uh, who may have served in Vietnam and, or know people who served in Vietnam, you certainly heard the talk about uh, we weren't appreciated when we came back from our service in Vietnam. And, and not so these, uh, these Marines, the Marine security guards, they, they feel that they did the best they could. They're proud of what they did, justifiably so. They do regret that there were some people left behind. Uh, there was nothing they could do about it. The order was given. There's only one more helicopter, and it's coming to get the ambassador. There's not, there was absolutely nothing they could have done, any one of these Marines. They, you certainly can't countermand the order from Washington, uh, so, so they, they, they couldn't do that. So they, there is, to some extent, that kind of regret that they didn't get everybody out. Yeah, okay. Out of 7,400, 7,400 people, they got 7,000 out. Uh, they regret that there were still 400, but they got 7,000 out. And, and the other thing is that um, uh, they feel badly that they lost two of their own, and, uh, and Judge and McMahon. Uh, and in fact, uh, because of the confusion of those last days, uh, uh, their bodies were not removed from Saigon. There was, uh, the, it was only after everybody was back on the fleet that they realized that the remains of Judge McMahon had been left behind in, in Saigon. And uh, that, uh, uh, that couldn't, that, they, they couldn't stand that. So what happened was uh, 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 Charles McMahon was from, the, the, it was from Massachusetts. And so uh, Senator Ted Kennedy uh, began back-channel negotiations with the North Vietnamese government. And a year later, uh, two of his aides were sent to, uh, to uh, Vietnam, where the North Vietnamese government turned over the remains of Judge McMahon. Uh, McMahon is now buried in his hometown in Massachusetts and Judge in his hometown in, um, in Iowa. And I should put in a quick plug, uh, if you go to fallofsaigon.org, that is the website of the Fall of Saigon Association, which, is, which consists of many, many of these Marines who served in those last uh, hours, days, and weeks. And uh, it's dedicated to the memory of Judge McMahon. There's, there's scholarships in their name that are given out to high school students every year. And the, their families are still involved. I had the privilege of, a year ago, April, the, uh, the association had a reunion in Quantico for the 35th anniversary of the Fall of Saigon. And they, uh, very flattered, they invited me to participate in it with them. And, uh, and there, was, uh, there was Corporal Judge's sister there, and uh, uh, mother is still alive, and, and relatives of McMahon. It's, a, it's, it's become a very closely bonded family. They, uh, they, they keep in touch all the time, and it's really quite, quite poignant uh, how they, that, that, if they regret something, it's that they lost two of their own. Uh, and, and it took a little while to get them back. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I think they would like me to sign some books out in the lobby. Thank you so much for being here.